Adolf Hitler was arguably the most evil man of the 20th century, but whilst many people know what he did, there is not enough concentration on the forces that created him. This film attempts to explore what made Hitler a monster and Hitler's ideas, which he expounded in his autobiography, Mein Kampf. They were rooted in 19th and early 20th century German philosophy, extreme nationalism and racism. This analysis of his life, personality, and the forces that shaped him will explain how the unbelievable occurred. Hitler, by the sheer force of his personality and charisma, seduced different elements of German society by promising them panaceas for their troubled lives. Often motivated by self-interest, the best educated nation in the world, democratically, voted into power, an insane, narcissistic racist who, like a Pied Piper of German folklore, led them to their doom. His life and its study is a stark warning to future generations of the dangers of blindly following the populist leader who promises all, but in the end brings about chaos and destruction. Hitler was born on the 20th of April, 1889, in Branau on the Inn, a picturesque little town in Lower Austria. The area was very Catholic, very conservative, and very parochial. He was the son of a 52-year-old Austrian customs official called Alois Schickelgruber, and his third wife and second cousin, Clara Pertz. His father was illegitimate, and the name was later changed to Hitler by his father, who later married his mother. Family relations were very complicated. Adolf was his mother's fourth child and the first one to survive infancy. He also had two half-siblings from his father's second marriage, Alois Jr., born in 1882, and Angler in 1883. The father was prone to drunken rages and beat his eldest son, who was in turn jealous of Adolf, who was pampered by his young mother. But young Adolf was not spared. According to Alois Jr., he was afraid that after a beating, his father had killed Adolf. Between 1892 and 95, Alois found work in Passau, on the German side of the border. In 1895, his father retired after 40 years in the service of the Habsburg Empire and bought a remote farm near Lampach in Upper Austria. He hoped to make a living as a farmer and beekeeper. After a fight with his father, Alois Jr. left home at 14 and was disinherited. He now has grandchildren living in America. 13-year-old Angela, Adolf and Edmund, born in 1896, remained at home. There was to be one more child, Paula. Hitler was educated in the village school that had one class for all ages. The rundown farm was unproductive, so in 1897 the farm was sold and the family moved to temporary quarters in Lampach, where Hitler went to the Benedictine Boys Choir School. His mother Clara attended mass regularly, but his anti-clerical father kept his distance. Hitler later wrote, I had an excellent opportunity to intoxicate myself with the solemn splendor of the brilliant church festivals, wonderfully exercising man's need for something supernatural. It well knew how to work on people, its mystical cult, its large sublime cathedrals, blessed music, solemn rites and incense. In 1898, the family moved to a new village south of Linz. Alois brought a small house next to the cemetery. Goebbels wrote about it. This was his realm, small and low ceilinged. This is where he designed plans and dreamt of the future. So this is where a genius developed. I'm feeling quite sublime and solemn. As a nine-year-old, Hitler went to the village school. He said, even as a boy, I was no pacifist and all attempts to educate me in that direction came to nothing. One of his fellow pupils, later Abbot Baldwin, recalled, playing war, nothing but playing war, 
Even we children found it boring after a while, but he always found some children, particularly amongst the younger ones, who would play with him. Otherwise, he practiced his favorite sport, shooting at rats with a handgun behind the cemetery next to his house. The Boer War of 1899 to 1902 excited many Austrian German nationalists. David versus Goliath, the poor Dutch farmers pitted against the huge might of the British Empire. Hitler wrote, every day I waited impatiently for the newspapers, privilege of witnessing this heroic struggle even at a distance. In 1923, Hitler said, on the side of the Boers, the just will to liberty, on the side of the British, greed for money and diamonds. In 1900, six-year-old Edmund died of measles and Adolf was now the only boy in the family. Difficulties with his father increased. He demanded absolute obedience. A school acquaintance of Hitler wrote, frequently, his father put two fingers in his mouth, let out a piercing whistle, and Adolf would quickly rush to his father. He often berated him. Adolf liked to read, but his father didn't hand out any money for books. Aloha only had one book, a volume on the Franco-Prussian War. But in Mein Kampf, he mentions his father's library. All witnesses portrayed Clara as a calm, loving mother. Aloha wanted his son to become a civil servant. In 1900, he went to the real school in Linz. In his first year, his report was unsatisfactory. Because of low marks in maths and natural history, he was kept back a year. According to school reports, every year he received a reprimand for his general conduct and not producing homework. His tuition fees were waived, which meant his family were in financial difficulties. This is a later quote from his French teacher, Dr. Huna. He was decidedly gifted, if one-sided, but he had difficulty controlling his temper. He was considerably intractable and willful, and always had to be right, and easily flew off the handle, and clearly found it difficult to accommodate himself to the limits of the school. He demanded unconditional subordination from his schoolmates, enjoyed the role of leader, and had been influenced by Karl May's stories and tales of Red Indians. Hitler later spoke about May. I read him by candlelight with a large magnifying glass and moonlight. He introduced me to geography. His sister Paula remembered, every night Hitler got a thrashing because he came home late. Hitler painted a negative picture of his father. I was forced into opposition for the first time in my life. Goebbels wrote, Hitler suffered almost the same youth as I did. The father a domestic tyrant, the mother a source of kindness and love. Hitler later told Hans Frank, his lawyer and later governor of Poland, that even as a 12-year-old, he had to take his drunken father home from bars. And he said to Frank, this was the most terrible shame I ever felt. His father in retirement inhabited saloons every day where he met with nationalist friends. Alois was a pan-German but still loyal to the Emperor Franz Joseph. Linz High School was politically turbulent. The Catholics and Habsburg loyalists fought against the Libertines and German nationalists. The loyals collected black and gold ribbons and portraits of the imperial couple, Franz Joseph and the Empress Elizabeth. The German nationalists collected busts of Bismarck and greater German badges. Hitler in Mein Kampf described how he took part and sang Deutschland über alles. In their German nationalism, students were far more radical than their teachers, who as civil servants had to be loyal to the emperor at the expense of their careers. Hitler's favorite teacher was Dr. Leopold Perch, who was one of his first mentors and an anti-Semitic conspiracy theorist. Hitler wrote, he used our budding nationalistic fanaticism as a means of educating us frequently appealing to our national honour. Thus he was able to discipline us little ruffians. Perch was Hitler's teacher for three years in geography and two years in history. He also ran the school library, which brought him into particularly close contact with the young Hitler, whose reading he guided. In 1905, Perch joined Linz City Council as a representative of the German People's Party. 
He gave popular lectures on Germanic history. Hitler liked to emphasize that his experience as an Austrian German in the multinational empire gave him a far more intense nationalism than those of the German Reich. Hitler later stated, I learned that people of the same blood should be in the same Reich. He joined the camp of the radical Volkish nationalists and rejected the multinational state. The High School of Linz had a good reputation because almost one third of its students came from out of town. One such student from Vienna was Ludwig Wittgenstein. He was Hitler's junior by two days, but two grades above him. Wittgenstein was a conspicuous figure. He spoke an unusually high German, wore very elegant clothes, was very sensitive and extremely unsociable. He demanded that everyone address him formally as Herr Ludwig. Pupils would affirm that those of Jewish descent, like Wittgenstein, had no trouble at all, and many participated in Catholic religious instruction. At the time, there were 17 Jewish students, 323 Catholics, 19 Protestants, and one Greek Orthodox from Bosnia. Hitler was 14 in 1903, when a fight over language broke out in Linz. The bishop admitted a Czech sermon in the church. Further, in 1904, German nationalists disrupted a concert by the Czech violinist Jan Kubelik. On the 3rd of January 1903, Alois Hitler, Hitler's father, died of a heart attack in the local tavern. He was 65 years old. Hitler's grades at school had not improved, so he had to leave. His doting mother sold the family home and moved to a third floor flat in Linz so that Hitler could be boarded at a school in Steyr. In 1904, Hitler was confirmed in Linz Cathedral. In 1942, Hitler said, at 13, 14 and 15, I no longer believed in anything. Certainly none of my friends believed in the so-called communion. I thought at the time everything should be blown up. His grades continued to deteriorate and after a lung ailment, he finished his school career. According to relatives, the sick boy was completely pampered by his mother. The family doctor was Jewish, Dr. Bloch. Later on, as an American exile, he published his memoirs and gave a remarkable picture of young Hitler. Dr. Bloch wrote, To a very large extent, the boy lived in himself. His most striking feature was his love for his mother. I have never witnessed a closer attachment. She admired his watercolour drawings and admired his artistic ambitions. By this time, Hitler had determined on a career in the arts. His interest in politics also continued. He devoured newspapers, read nationalist papers, which were increasingly anti-Semitic. In the racist Volkish politics of German and Austrian German nationalism, the Jews were more and more singled out as those responsible for all the ills in German society. A tiny percentage of the population, they had a very high visible profile across the arts, sciences and business. Racist politics could not accept that a Jew could be a German, so consequently all the ills of society were blamed on them. In Mein Kampf he stated that the two years in Linz with his mother were the happiest in his life. He discovered a passion for music. In 1905 he met August Kubisek. Hitler profited from his excellent training in music. In his autobiography, Kubisek describes in detail the impact that Wagner's opera Rienzi had on the young Hitler. Wagner was a notorious anti-Semite and German nationalist and was at the centre of an intellectual group of huge influence in German and Austrian German society. The two went to see Wagner's opera Rienzi in Linz, which is the story of Kolle de Rienzi, the son of a Roman bartender who became the People's Tribune who united a splintered Italy into a powerful republic. After the opera, Kubisek recounts in his memoirs that the 16-year-old Hitler was completely transported and walked with him in the mountains around Linz. Kubisek wrote, at such a young age, Hitler also fantasized about his role in the German people's destiny. In grand, infectious images, he outlined to me the future of the German people Later on, the Rienzi Overture became the anthem of the Third Reich, always played at Nuremberg party rallies. According to Kubisek, 
Hitler fell in love with a blonde Lintz beauty called Stephanie. Shy, he admired her from afar. He dreamt of her as his wife and even designed the house they would live in. But he did not exchange a single word with her. He lived in his own fantasies. In May 1906, despite the family's reduced circumstances, he didn't take any jobs or apprenticeships. He announced he wanted to go to Vienna to become an artist. So at age 17, he arrived in the city for the first time. He was entranced by the architecture of the Ring Boulevard. He studied the picture galleries. He admired the opera house. He sent four picture postcards to Kubisek and stayed there for two weeks. During his time there, he witnessed the converted Jew Mahler conducting Tristan on May the 8th. Later on, when in power, all Jews, regardless of their own affiliations, including conversion to Christianity, were barred from being part of the cultural and artistic life of the German Reich. In January 1907, Clara Hitler consulted Dr. Bloch. Four days later, she had an operation for breast cancer, and again the family had to move to pay the bills. Totally self-centered, Hitler managed to persuade his ailing mother to let him return to Vienna to attend the Academy of Arts. But his work didn't meet the requirements of the Academy. He returned to Linz, where Dr. Bloch informed him that Clara's condition was hopeless. 18 years old, Hitler cared for his mother with Dr. Bloch calling every day. On December the 21st, she died and her son sketched her as she lay on her deathbed. Three days later, the family called on the Jewish Dr. Bloch to express their gratitude. In 1938, after the Anschluss, Hitler placed Bloch under protection and his family were undisturbed and allowed to keep their property. In 1940, he and his wife emigrated to America. His medical degree was not recognized and so he could no longer practice. Hitler's noble Jew died in 1945. After his mother's death, with a small pension, Hitler returned to Vienna, where his friend Kubisek joined him. He made a meager living selling hand-painted postcards. He spent much of his time in the Spectator's Gallery in Parliament. There were 516 seats, the largest parliament in Europe, equal suffrage for men over 24. Kubisek wrote, it amazed me that Adolf was that energetic at 8.30 in the morning, and he said to Kubisek, you can only build when the foundation is made. Hitler called the parliament a wild, gesticulating mass, screaming all at once in every different key. Indeed, the parliament permitted 10 different languages. Hitler wrote, the more the linguistic babble corrodes and disorganized parliament, the closer drew the inevitable hour of disintegration of the Babylonian Empire and with it the hour of freedom for my German Austrian people. Only in this way could Anschluss with the mother country be restored. Hitler grew to hate the cosmopolitan modernist Vienna, which he believed was destroying the pure Volk of the German Austrian people. His fortunes deteriorated and he finished up in a hostel. In the hostel he read assiduously and became more and more engrossed in the racist Germanic writings of the pseudo-philosophers in Vienna. From 1907, Vienna had a populist mayor called Karl Luger, who had come to power on an anti-Semitic ticket. He was a brilliant rabble-rouser. The Vienna that Hitler lived in was an extraordinary city that both fascinated and repelled. It was the centre of a polyglot empire. We can see in retrospect the seedbed of the catastrophe that was to overtake Central Europe in the 20th century. It was also the centre of what was the most exciting in modernist culture. It was a cosmopolitan metropolis at the centre of an ultra-conservative empire and it was also the European capital of Kitsch. The metropolis par excellence of the value vacuum of modern civilization. Liberal humanists like Freud and Schlitzler were all too keenly aware that waiting to erupt beneath the thin veneer of bourgeois civilization lay powerful destructive sources. Vienna was 10% Jewish and people of Jewish birth were very much at the forefront of modernity. They were highly visible in the professions and in an empire which was so fractured, the majority of Jews turned to German culture. 
Hitler became obsessed with reading tracts on race history which abounded in Vienna. As a result of the turbulence of the modern world, pseudoscientists began to put forward theories of the modern world which divided people into races. Blood was what determined your race. A Jew could never be a German. It didn't matter if you were a rabbi or a Marxist or a convert. Blood determined your place in the world. In Vienna, the disaffected, disappointed Hitler began to see the Jew as responsible for all the ills of mankind. Who were the individuals who molded Hitler's thinking? Houston Stuart Chamberlain, 1855 to 1927, was born in England and died in Bayreuth. Karl Skorsky, the historian, called him John the Baptist because he would be the forerunner to the Messiah who would save Germany. He was an Englishman who went to live in Germany and fell in love. He loathed modernity and industrialization and became obsessed by the myths and legends of the ancient Germanic peoples. He was also obsessed with the music of Wagner and plunged heart and soul into the depths of the master. Later on, he became a close friend of Wagner's widow and married their daughter. In 1889, Chamberlain moved to Vienna and published his most famous work, The Foundations of the 19th Century, in which he describes the pyramid of the races. The Aryans are the master race, and Jesus was an Aryan. He claimed all great European writers were Aryan, from Homer to Dante to Shakespeare and Goethe. The Jews were the anti-race, but the only race capable of destroying the Aryan. Chamberlain was hugely influential in the German-speaking world. When he sent his book, The Foundations of the 19th Century, to Kaiser Wilhelm II, the Kaiser replied, God has sent you to me and Germany. George von Schoenerer, 1842 to 1921. His father was one of the most important railway pioneers in Austria, completing the first railway on continental Europe and was elected to the nobility for his services to the empire. He was an employee of the Vienna Rothschilds who had financed the railway network. His wife, ironically, was the great granddaughter of a rabbi. Von Schoenerer studied agronomy, the science of the soil, at Austrian and Hungarian universities. After graduating, he worked on his father's estate. He is a paternalistic figure concerned with the plight of the peasants on the estate. The brilliant Prussian Chancellor Bismarck created German unification in three wars, with Denmark, Austria and France, cementing in the German psyche the power of war to feed German pride. After the Austrian defeat in 1866, Schoenerer became an ardent admirer of Bismarck. Even though Bismarck rejected Austro-German nationalism, there was at this stage an alliance between Austria and Germany. In 1873, the stock market crashed, which destroyed the life savings of thousands of ordinary individuals. With historic hindsight, it proved to be the death knell of liberalism. Schoenerer was elected to the Imperial Council, where he emerged as a great orator and a real firebrand. His politics became more and more extreme. He agitated both against Jewish capitalism and Catholicism and desperately wanted union with Germany. If only we belong to the German Reich, he said. His main appeal was to the lower middle classes who dreamt of a single state for ethnic Germans. In 1882, he had drafted with the Jewish Victor Adler the Linz program. Imbued with race theory, he wanted the Germanization of the Austrian state. He proposed ceding the Slavic parts of the empire to Hungary, and he wanted German to become the official language of Austria. He said, we protest against all attempts to convert Austria into a Slavic state. We should continue to agitate for the maintenance of German as the official language. In 1885, he added an Aryan paragraph to the Linz program, adding that only Aryans could become part of the German-Austrian state. He also wanted a break with Catholic Rome. He considered his struggle for Austrian Germans as a fight against the Jews. His campaign became even more vocal on the arrival of poor Eastern European Jews, refugees, escaping the pogroms of Russia, which began in 1881. The exploitative international Jews are trying to destroy the empire, he said. 
His ideals became models for German student fraternities. He became a very powerful figure in Austrian politics. He urged German Austrians to wear the blue cornflower, the most favorite flower of the Kaiser, along with German national colors, red, black, and yellow. He wanted Anschluss with Germany and the dissolution of the Habsburg Empire. Any member of his organization had to prove Aryan descent. Totally anti-religious, his followers would meet during the solstices. The Germanic history of the tribes was celebrated and battle songs sung. He said, if we don't expel the Jews, we Germans will be expelled. He wanted nationalization of the Rothschild-owned railways. In 1887, he wrote, the Jew is a blood-sucking vampire and he sponsored a bill to restrict Jewish emancipation. In the preamble, he wrote, the Jews are the enemy. By 1907, there were 20 members of his party in parliament. His ideology was very closely linked to Teutonic paganism with its cultish 2000 year history. He even installed a new calendar. Year one was 113 BCE when the German tribes had a victory over Rome. He called himself the Knight of Rosenau. He even tried to resurrect the old Germanic names for the months of the year. The war on the Jews is a basic pillar of ideology. Dr. Karl Luger, 1844 to 1910, the future mayor of Vienna, came from a modest background. He studied law at the University of Vienna and was a member of the Catholic Student Association. He became a lawyer and was acutely aware of the problems of ordinary working people. In 1873, the stock market crashed, which led to economic and social misery for thousands. He hated the corruption of Vienna City Council, and when he was elected, he became the champion of the ordinary. He managed to unite German nationalists and Christian socialists. Deeply Catholic, he blamed the Jews for everything wrong in Viennese society. In 1897, the charismatic, popular Lurger became mayor of Vienna, a position he was to hold until 1907. Hitler was fascinated by him and paid tribute to him in his book Mein Kampf. Other influences on Hitler were Guido von Liszt, 1848 to 1919, and his disciple George von Liebenfels, 1874 to 1954. They were both influential figures in the underground racist world of fin de siècle Vienna. Deeply alienated, they wanted to take the German people back to a time of glory when the pagan tribes defeated the might of Rome. They dreamt of a long forward leader who would lead the Aryan people to victory. Also violently anti-Semitic, they concentrated on the pure Aryan myth and the dream of the longed for leader. Liebensfels wrote, everything the leader does is right because it emanates from him. They were totally undemocratic, believed in race and blood and the supremacy of the Aryan people. Liszt used the swastika as a symbol and their ideas were very popular amongst the dispossessed in cosmopolitan Vienna. Hitler loathed Vienna. It was there that he absorbed both the Catholic and pagan versions of anti-Semitism. Pope Pius IX, 1846 to 1878, and his successor, Leo XIII, 1878 to 1903, were both incredibly conservative, fighting the twin pillars of liberalism and socialism. Violently anti-Semitic, they believed that the only good Jew was a converted Jew. Hitler left Vienna for Munich, and when World War I broke out, the Austrian Hitler joined the German army and was decorated for bravery. Ironically, it was his Jewish captain, Hugo Gutmann, who pinned the Iron Cross medal on him. When the war came to an end, Hitler was recovering in hospital from a gas attack. On the 18th of November, 1918, he returned to Munich, which was in the grip of revolution. The patriotic First World War turned out to be one of the most appalling episodes in human history. Modern technology was harnessed to mass murder. The losses on all sides were terrifying. To give one example, in 1915, a quarter of all 19-year-old Frenchmen were killed. The war didn't end because of any decisive battles. Revolution broke out in Russia. 
It was overtaken by a communist revolution that led to Russia's exit from the war. Revolutions spread throughout Europe. Many of the leaders were of Jewish birth. All had rejected their origins for internationalism. In Munich, there were three left-wing revolutions. The situation in Munich was terrifying. There were food shortages and lawlessness. Soldiers were returning from the front. Many had lost limbs or had been blinded and were totally disillusioned with the Germany they found. In this time of crisis and polarization of politics, right-wing groups were also planning a new destiny. The third communist revolution was finally destroyed by the Freikorps, an organization of right-wing militarists. On the 14th of August 1919, they proclaimed a free state of Bavaria. During this chaotic period, Hitler worked for the German army, checking extremist organizations. He also participated in national thinking courses, organized by the educational department of the Bavarian army. The papal nuncio to Bavaria, Eugenio Pacelli, wrote this letter. The scene was indescribable, the confusion totally chaotic. In the midst of all this, a gang of young women of dubious appearance, Jews, like the rest of them, hanging around. The boss was Levian's mistress, a young Russian woman and a Jew, and a divorcee. And it was to her that I was obliged to pay homage in order to proceed. Levian is a young man, also Russian and a Jew, pale, dirty, and with drugged eyes, a Jew. In 1933, as the Vatican representative on foreign affairs, he concluded a concordat with Hitler. In 1939, he became Pope Pius XII. In 1920, working for the army, Hitler found a group that interested him, the German Workers' Party. They met in beer kellers and attracted the displaced and the disaffected. The Kaiser had been overthrown. In January 1919, Germany went to the polls for the first ever democratic elections in its history. A broad left coalition took power. A remarkably liberal constitution was drafted by the Jewish lawyer, Hugo Preuss. After the horror of the First World War, the German government hoped the Allies would treat them reasonably. Instead, they wanted to punish Germany for the war. Germany lost much of its territory and thus its natural resources. They had to pay a huge fine not just in gold, but in produce, and there was to be no real rearming. The treaty was dictated, not negotiated. It made economic recovery almost impossible. The mark crashed and millions of people suffered. Unemployment reached six million. Against the backdrop, the culture that developed in Weimar, Germany, the government centered in Weimar because Berlin was too politically volatile, was innovative in cinema, theater, art, literature, and music. But to many people who felt their lives had been destroyed and that Germany had lost its pride and character, it was decadent and it was Jewish. The German Workers' Party was just one extremist group that played on the fears of the dispossessed. To them, the demon was the Jew, who was not German by blood and in their ludicrous fantasies was trying to destroy what was left of German society. Hitler was in sympathy with their views. He had studied acting and presentation, ironically with a Jew. Permeated by ideology, he emerged as a spellbinding orator who could bind the disaffected to him. Ruthlessly, he took over the small party and co-wrote the following manifesto, which later became the manifesto of the Nazi party. Their symbol was the swastika. When did Hitler really learn to hate the Jewish people and blame them for all the ills of society? By the time he went to Vienna, he was already a committed German nationalist, imbued with the music of Wagner. It was in Vienna that he subsumed himself in all the race literature of that strange city, named by the Jewish satirist Karl Kraus as an experimental station on the way to the end of the world. The reality was that the majority of Jews of Vienna were liberal and bourgeois and loyal citizens of the empire. But on the fringe of new ideas were names like Freud, Mahler and Schoenberg, new and disquieting. Hitler's views were reinforced by his time in Munich during the revolution. To him, the Jew was an evil force, each in league with each other. 
and determined to destroy and take over German civilization. In Munich, the left-wing revolutions failed and Bavaria emerged as the most right-wing of all the German states. Many Baltic Germans and Russian aristocrats had escaped to Munich from the communist revolution in Russia. In the fear and the chaos, they blamed the most visible non-Christian minority, the Jews. The fact that many of the revolutionaries in Russia were of Jewish birth exacerbated the situation. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion is a scurrilous forgery which emanated from Tsarist Russia and claimed that the Jews were trying to take over the world. It found its way to Munich through these individuals. Hitler began to mix in these circles. He was introduced to extreme right-wing German aristocrats, including General Ludendorff, one of the heroes of World War I. Hitler was led to believe that the time was right for a takeover of Munich an attempted putsch in November 1923. It was unsuccessful and he was put on trial for treason. Ironically, because Ludendorff was also in the dock with him, it attracted extraordinary press attention. For the first time, his name appeared in international newspapers. At the trial, he spoke passionately as a German nationalist. The right-wing judges sentenced him to five years in jail a very lenient sentence for treason. It was later commuted to nine months. He was given the freedom of Lenzburg Castle, where many of the officers were in sympathy with him, and his own secretary, who later became his deputy, Rudolf Hess. In the castle, he was visited by Winifred Wagner and many other wealthy, high society, right-wing anti-Semites. It was here that he wrote Mein Kampf, My Struggle, in which he laid out his views. Emerging from prison, he decided that the way to power from now on was to use the democratic process and the renamed Nazi party went to the polls. In the elections of the 4th of May 1924, they secured 6.6% of the vote. It was during this time he attracted to himself figures who would be with him to the end, including, arguably, the best propagandist of the 20th century, Joseph Goebbels. He had his own newspaper, which spewed out the most appalling racist slogans against the Jewish people. Although he was attracting more and more followers and had his own private army, the SA, under the command of Ernst Röhm, the Nazi party was not doing too well at the polls. Why? Because America had decided to invest money, stabilize the currency, and to make Germany a safer place. In the elections between 1924 and 1928, the Nazi vote went down to 2.6%, with the broad left and the Liberal Party attracting most support. It's an irony of history that when society is relatively stable, economically, socially and politically, the need to hate and find a scapegoat is not so prevalent. But in October 1929, Wall Street crashed, and in the linked economies, Germany, so newly recovered, was plunged into chaos. Hitler, with his charisma, his private army and his promises, began to succeed at the polls. And in the elections of September 1930, polled 18% of the vote. By July of 1932, through the deep depression, his figures went up to 37%. He used every modern method of propaganda and seduction to appeal to the voters. He promised every group a paradise, provided they followed and obeyed him. The president of Germany was a right-wing war hero called Hindenburg. By the end of 1932, where the Nazis were the largest party in the Reichstag, he was persuaded to bring three of them into government, and Hitler became Chancellor of Germany in January the 30th, 1933. On February the 27th, 1933, the Reichstag burnt down. It was the perfect storm for Hitler. Constitutional liberties were suspended and a state of emergency declared. And in the elections of the 5th of March, 1933, the Nazis polled nearly 44% of the vote, but with the backing of other right-wing parties, they took control. The law was passed, the unity of the party in the state, and from then on, there were no more elections in Germany. Anti-Semitism was an important cement in the mass Nazi appeal. 
But not all Germans who voted for the Nazis were necessarily racists or anti-Semites, but they were nonetheless prepared to ignore or acquiesce to this part of the programme because they saw him as the saviour of Germany. Hitler was Führer, an almost messianic figure with a godlike appeal to the German people, but a pagan messiah with a sword in his hand to purify and lead the German people to their rightful destiny. Hitler was a man of his word, and between 1933 and 1941, the Jews of Germany were gradually economically, socially, and politically excluded from German society. The aim was to rob them of their dignity and possessions and to force them to emigrate. A component of the Jewish tragedy was that as the 30s darkened, there were few places of refuge. By 1941, after Hitler had conquered much of Europe, there could be no Judenrein Reich, and so the Germans and their allies turned to the ultimate exclusion, genocide. The tragedy was compounded by the fact that German Jewry, before Hitler, was the most integrated of any Jewish community in the world. Assimilation in 1927 was running at 45 per cent. A hundred thousand Jews had fought for Germany in World War I. 12,000 had died on the battlefield and 35,000 had been decorated for bravery. A proper study of Hitler raises profound questions about the nature of humanity itself and is a warning for our time. It illustrates how people can be lured by short-term self-interest into following individuals and creeds that have no moral compass and ultimately lead to destruction. It also shows that even in this horror, there were extraordinary individuals who rose above their times. They came from every walk of society and our next video will be devoted to that.